Hello, everyone. Welcome to Baker Tilly's second annual Life Sciences Industry Forecast event. Um, as we look at key trends that we've observed in the global life sciences industry that we believe are going to significantly impact the industry in 2023 and beyond. We've had the pleasure of working with a cross section of the life sciences industry, both pharma, biotech, medical device and medical diagnostics. And we're excited to bring some of those insights to you all today. We're going to have a cross section of our leadership team here within our life sciences team coming to present on a variety of topics. Um, we're going to keep it fast moving. Um, if you have questions throughout, I encourage you to submit questions throughout. Um, it would be wonderful if you could submit your questions with your, with your name. So just in case we're not able to respond to your questions at the end, you know, we can absolutely get back to you. So, so please use the Q&A uh, feature in the, in the platform. We're going to have a conversation, kind of kicking off the conversation here shortly, the discussion of capital markets and what we see in terms of the availability of capital, as well as how companies are raising capital uh, to support the global initiatives that they're undertaking. We're going to talk about the evolving healthcare market dynamics, as we did last year, thinking about some of the key trends that are influencing both the commercial as well as the medical platforms that our, our, in, that our clients in the industry is supporting. We're going to talk about what we see in the global compliance uh, arena in terms of new and evolving regulations or standards, uh, as well as enforcement activity. We'll take a deep dive on that compliance conversation to talk about HCP engagements and highlight opportunities to streamline operational controls and improve compliance in HCP engagements. At that point, I want to, I want to take a step back and, and talk about you know, a very pertinent issue to the global industry around uh, health equity and patient access. Um, you know, with a lot of the attention around, around ESG or environmental, social and governance initiatives, uh, especially in this industry, I think there's, this is the right time for us to start having a more robust ESG dialogue in this industry. Uh, and it really needs to start around health equity and patient access. So we'll have a conversation there. But recognizing that's also a global initiative uh, we will close out the conversation today with a discussion of, you know, what we see happening, you know, within the global industry uh, and some of those some of those key trends to, to global to globalization and looking to, to broaden our, our clients' perspectives. In terms of our speakers today, you're going you're to hear from all of our partners. So Mike Green, myself, David Gregory, Mark Scallon, uh, as well as a number of our other leaders in the practice, uh, Grace Macalino, uh, Samantha Sutherland, Mario Prohaski and Samantha Brabant. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mike to get us started with a discussion on capital markets. Thanks, Darren. Let me set the stage for the life science uh, industry. Over the last few years, the life science industry has reached record levels. We've seen 7% annual growth in pharma sales. Uh, the IPO market has been very strong in 2020, 2021. There were more IPOs than the four prior years combined. And uh, recently, uh, Bio uh, announced that over 55% of all new drug therapies are coming from smaller emerging uh, life science companies. This bodes well for the future. So what's in store for um, 2023? Well, let's first take a look at where we are today. Today, life science companies are facing some financing challenges. Uh, competition for talent is increasing and difficult. The stock market is depressed and the industry is seeing the effects of global uh, and political unrest. So while the life science industry is facing some short term challenges, science doesn't stop. Clinical trials doesn't stop. So for the future, it looks promising. The good news is that capital is always available for those companies that are at the top of their game. So let's look at this industry in a little bit more detail and let's look at either ends of the spectrum. So first I wanna look at those pharma and med device companies that have revenue, and then we'll look at those pre-revenue life science companies. So with med device and pharma companies uh, that have revenue, they'll tend to be the larger companies, more, ex more experienced. Those companies have cash reserves. Most of them have cash reserves. So expect to see these companies picking up smaller life science companies to bolster their pipelines in order to increase revenue as the valuations remain depressed. So while the stock market being depressed has created some challenges on the financing side, it's also created some opportunities, especially for those companies with cash reserves. In recent months, we've seen an uptick in the M&A activity. 
We've seen J&J uh, &J announce the merger with Abiomed. We have both Amgen and J&J &J in discussions with Horizon Therapeutics. And we have some credible rumors that Janssen and Sanofi are in merger discussions. So now um, this bodes well for 2023, although the M&A activity has been uh, depressed in 2022, I think the signs are good that we're gonna see an increase in M&A activity uh, in the coming months. So now let's take a look at those pre-revenue life science companies. This is where things are a little difficult. Those life science companies that have good technology and, and or promising clinical trial results are always going to have access to capital, albeit at more expensive rates than uh, in the prior year. Those companies that are in less favorable sector uh, of the life science industry and or have had disappointing clinical trial results are going to struggle. It's going to be difficult for them to raise capital. At the moment, investors are becoming more and more selective about companies they invest in. Investors are in the driver's seat. They are um, dictating both structure and valuations. Now, while that's all being said, the life science companies have always been very creative when it comes to financing structures and techniques. And I expect that will continue in the coming year. So um, to sum up, quality companies always will have access to capital. And these companies are um, creating what I think is uh, increased activity in the financing and capital sectors in 2023. And with that, thank you for listening. And I'd like to hand you off to Grace and David, who are going to uh, continue the discussions and are going to talk about healthcare market dynamics. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for your insights on the capital markets. I know that's a, a, a challenging environment as well. We are now going to take on the uh, the healthcare market dynamics uh, for sure, which is always a bit topsy turvy. Healthcare has been challenging since the beginning of time, and we're not going to say much any different here today. But um, uh, you know, pleasure to have you join us for the next uh, fifteen minutes or so to talk about the challenges uh, as it relates to healthcare market dynamics. I'm David Gregory. I'm a healthcare leader and principal um, here at Baker Tilly. Grace? Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Grace Macalino. I'm a director in the healthcare advisory group and uh, happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So so Grace and I are both um, uh, experts and, and uh, deeply experienced um, in, the, in the healthcare marketplace. We obviously bring slightly different perspectives, but we align on many of the dynamics that are very challenging for um, for all participants uh, in the healthcare ecosystem these days, and we we want to just uh, touch on what we think is coming in in 2023 in the foreseeable future um, around some of the really important issues that are out there, um, including things like the health inequities that are out there. That's right up Grace's alley. I know she'll uh, she'll touch on that in a little bit more detail. Um, we've got our perspective on on value based care. We've got our perspective on real world evidence and, and price transparency and some of the other buzzwords that are going on there. And we're, we're going to try to stitch all those together and give you kind of a coherent uh, crystal ball of, of what to expect, um, you know, in the in the coming year and multiple years um, as we go forward. So uh, happy to impart some knowledge here today. And, uh, uh, you know, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and, and talk about the um, uh, some of the things that are changing in terms of the delivery of care, uh, which is on the next slide. Okay, so obviously one of the most important dynamics um, within healthcare, whether it's 2023 or any year, are the, are the trends in care delivery. And then just a quick comment or two that we're going to make on margin because there's no margin, no mission is the, is the saying that's been out there for a long time. Site of care. I think everybody would acknowledge that um, that's been changing over time. We're here to say that that's going to accelerate um, in 2023 and beyond. Uh, with regard to shift from acute sites to non-acute sites uh, into these other settings that are here on the slide, with the idea of lower costs, improved provider and payer margins, um, and to some extent, improved patient satisfaction. I think, you know, that's one thing that uh, is always important in this system, is to see how all these changes impact uh, patient satisfaction. Uh, we also would certainly want to call out home-based services. Uh, you know, the, the home is becoming a, a point of care delivery. 
um, you know, for sure. You know, and it's not just traditional home care. There's hospital at home programs um, and other virtual care programs that are taking hold. And, and we see the programs accelerating um, in 23 and beyond. We also see those programs certainly reducing costs, uh, improving outcomes. And as I already said, enhancing the patient experience, patient satisfaction results are off the charts uh, for, for hospital at home programs. And, and Grace, before I allow you to chime in on on this one, uh, you shouldn't need my permission, but I, I, uh, I'm kind of <laughs> dominating this slide here. But, but margin flows. Uh, you know, when you talk about um, trends in care delivery, you also need to be mindful of what is that doing to, you know, to margin flows because uh, uh, it, it needs to be there in order for you to produce new programs and to innovate, right? And the graying of America, the the older than 65 population is definitely still growing. And Medicare Advantage and Medicaid programs are going to be very important. Um, and so we think there's new uh, kind of margin pool um, opportunities and, and growth for sure. And 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 just want to make sure that um, you're thinking about these changes as as we go forward. Uh, Grace, any any further thoughts? For sure. No, 100 percent. I think that with these opportunities, as you know, we've laid them out here, uh, you know, come some challenges or at least some things that we need to be thinking about and keep on our radar. Right. There's, you know, data collection, you know, as we define patient outcomes, you know, these as we move into these non-traditional settings for care, where and how are we going to measure important variables that are associated with good outcomes and potentially bad outcomes? Right. So um, you're now moving out of, out of a hospital and into this hospital at home. You know, how do we be thoughtful and careful to really yeah. document what are what's important, what's not or, you know, what is the right mix of things to have a patient, you know, have good outcomes? The other thing I think that this highlights is, you know, when we think about health equity and, and health disparities, where and how uh, these issues or solutions are definitely uh, can't be one size fits all. Uh, as we think about social determinants of health and ways that um, different folks are impacted by different things, you know, a, a hospital at home model just might not be a realistic in, in a household that has many, many people living there with multi generations, uh, you know, folks that have two or three jobs and they're trying to navigate a lot of other sort of life uh, challenges and where and how, uh, you know, they have to, you know, bring in sort of healthcare in this setting, you know, might be an added challenge to all the other things they're, they're struggling and dealing with, right? So again, lots of neat opportunities for sure, challenges and considerations as, as we think about this uh, across the population broadly. Yeah, it's a great point, Grace. I mean, you know, healthcare is multidimensional, right? And, you know, from a patient standpoint, um, and so the programming um, you know, also needs to be multidimensional to kind of meet the patients where they are. And, and you just made some great points around health disparities, social determinants of health, uh, you know, measuring quality of care um, and, and the different levels, uh, you know, within there to, uh, to promote patient satisfaction and, and great quality. So uh, certainly um, great comments, uh, agree with all those. And I think we're now going to, to move into price transparency on the next slide. Great. So, you know, I, I'll start this one too, Grace, if you don't mind. I, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, price transparency is not just a hospital thing. I, I, I you know, certainly that's the title of this slide, but, um, you know, the first thing I'll do is kind of indicate that it's much broader than that, right? That there is uh, requirements on pharma, um, you know, to be more transparent. There are requirements on the health plan side to be mm -hmm. more transparent. So as a system, the U.S. has decided that we're going to shine a light on things that we historically haven't shined a light on um, with the ultimate goal of trying to give patients a better chance at understanding how much something's going to cost them before they enter the system. Because right now we pay, we play a lot of chicken, um, you know, with, with the economics of healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Where patients try to estimate um, to the best of their ability, what it's going to cost them before they go seek care. And then they get the bill afterwards. Um, and, and, the, and the bill afterwards is often a surprise. In yes. fact, you know, you guys have probably heard of the No Surprises Act, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is which is another attempt, you know, to try to minimize surprises in the healthcare system for patients. Um, and price transparency is in that mold. And I and I do think it's going to advance further. More hospitals are complying with price transparency when initially the requirement came out in 21 there were actually a minority of hospitals complied with this requirement because of the concern of the proprietary nature of the information. Um, that is getting better. 
I think there's more incentives to, you know, to put that information out there. So we see in 23 and on um, additional degrees of transparency, um, and we and and hopefully the understanding and or, or the understandability um, of the data that's being presented by all the stakeholders um, is going to improve for patients. Because right now, if somebody goes out to a website and tries to decide or tries to understand how much their colonoscopy is going to cost, um, it's it's not easy. Um, and yeah. it needs to be easier than it is today. And, and I think that trend is going to continue into 23. Grace? Yeah, I think the link to quality of care here is, you know, if and when we're able to have completely price be transparent, then really justifying additional costs or, you know, longer time or whatever it looks like where there are differences really has to highlight the quality. Where are you getting better care or why is this costing more because, you know, it's a center of excellence or, you know, really having to justify, frankly, you know, what does, uh, what are additional costs attributed to? So really, that's really where we're hoping, right, that price transparency, you know, leads to better quality of care because it's ha- going to have to be justified, right? Yep. Yep. I, 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 I would add that, you know, we, one thing we've also struggled with as a system, but we're getting better, is defining what good quality care is. I mean, and, and, and Grace, I think you would agree with that, that, you know, we still, you know, you can still have an honest conversation across the table with a payer and a provider, and they could have different definitions of what success is, um, you know, for, for quality, right, in terms of yeah. metrics and things of that nature. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't made as much progress as we would have liked for those of us that have been, you know, toiling in the system for more than a couple of years here, um, you know, I, I, I think just even simply the definition of quality um, is still an open issue, although I do think we've made progress. And I think that's another thing to watch very closely is um, is is how that continues to evolve um, in terms of what the metrics are and and just how we define quality. I agree. Uh, next slide. I actually think that brings us very nicely into, yep. you know, as we're now able to get better access to the data that hospitals are putting out as hospital records are able to be more digitized, you're able to really, really see sort of where um, the vast amount of real world data that will be available to us, you know, where and how um, analytics, the way we're able to um, generate real world evidence to really answer your question. Because I think part of the reason why quality is so tough to de- define in healthcare is because so much of those things have been sort of unknown and behind that sort of visible curtain, if you will. So. The FDA, at least specifically as it relates to the life sciences, are now uh, allowing more than just clinical trials to be able to justify, you know, um, uh, effectiveness in their studies as far as um, what they'll use, um, including real world evidence uh, for post-market safety and adverse events to uh, make regulatory decisions. And more and more just the appreciation for where and how can we use information that's out there to answer these important questions is is really um, starting to move to the forefront for sure. And it's definitely more 2023 and beyond. We're going to see that more and more for sure. Don't you agree? Absolutely. I mean, RWE has so much potential, um, RWD into RWE, but I, you know, and and, and the industry is really a buzz about, Mm -hmm. about deploying RWE in very meaningful ways. Right. And, and, and really shortening the timeframe between when that RWE is captured um, and and when it's actually analyzed and then fed back into the system, right? Because I, I think yeah. that's a that's a thing where you could actually see in 23 some real movement around mm-hmm. the turnaround time and the feedback loop, um, you know, from from you know kind of generation to what's the lesson learned from it, and then going right. back into the delivery system or into the research system, you know, to to leverage that you know the lessons learned from that RWE. So very very important going forward. Totally agree, Grace. And that really speaks to the comment you made earlier around sort of as technology, you know, AI, sort of our ability to be more um, just quick and thoughtful about using the data that are available, definitely going to lead to faster and and better outcomes, ultimately. Um, To round out our conversation, David, the next slide, you know, I, I love that you wanted to make sure that this was highlighted. And we talked a little bit about sort of the promise of value based care as sort of a buzzword and and some of the you know um pro- the promise of uh, that that may or may not be the right reality of the future but you know definitely would love to have you sort of start us off in in our closing moments about you know this 
idea of value-based care that I think we've been hearing a lot about and, you know, kind of where it's going. Yeah, there, there was a lot of fanfare around value-based care being uh, the end stage, the solution, right? The and and we've heard it before, you know, with with other solutions that could have been the end game, and they and they have not been. And I and 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 we at Baker Tilly are are, are starting to really believe that value based care is another kind of transitory state um, mm-hmm. in the maturation um, of of reimbursement tied to the clinical delivery of care. Um, mm-hmm. I you know certainly there is a lot of promise with value based care, but we also put that in quotations because. It has not delivered on all the promises, um, you know, that that were attached to it. And and I think that everybody needs to, you know, kind of introduce a healthy dose of 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 skepticism, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in 23 and beyond in terms of what you're doing uh, from a value based care perspective, whether you're in the med tech industry, pharma, um, you know, health plan provider. We have a holistic view here and all those stakeholders really need to, uh, you know, kind of think through. Uh, what what uh, what it's actually done, what it hasn't done, and make some adjustments. And I I think twenty three is going to be a year of adjustments with with regard to value based care. There are some prominent early adopters of value based care um, that are actually turning the bus around, um, mm-hmm. and and they're saying there's got to be a better way because there's a lot of variation in value based care because we have a lot of payers in our system, right? Yeah. We are we are not a national healthcare system. Um, mm-hmm. We have a lot of commercial payers. We have CMS with Medicare and Medicaid. We got a lot of payers, and and with that comes a lot of variation. So I, I do think that uh, you know twenty three is going to be a year of um, adjustments and 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 uh, revisiting past value based care programs and innovating um, yeah. and iterating uh, on on what those mean and 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 moving forward in a in a very innovative way. So uh, you know Grace, I you know do. Uh, you agree with the with kind of that sentiment? I do, and I think bringing it back to that health equity conversation, yes. I think it just comes back to perhaps in an ideal world where everyone had equal access, it, it, it might be an easier um, win, perhaps. But given that so many folks are in different places, I think that's where the challenge is in terms of this one size solution to to answer all problems is, is where it starts get t- getting tough, right? Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, 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 these are all, you know, kind of hairy challenges and the healthcare system has never backed down from them before. Um, right. You know, I think w- what we wanted to do is just kind of project into the coming year um, what what each of these uh, programs, um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to look like into 23, just sensitize you to some of the, the things that are coming for sure. But I I, I appreciate everybody's attention, Grace. I think we're probably out of time, and I we we may just want to cede the floor to our colleagues, um, Mark Scallon and and Sam Sutherland. They're going to next talk about uh, the compliance landscape, which is probably equally as complicated as what you and I just talked about, Grace. But uh, but thank you everybody uh, for your time, and and Mark and Sam are going to take it from here. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Scallon. I'm a principal at Baker Tilly and it's life sciences uh, consulting practice. I lead the compliance and ethics market offering for the industry at the firm. Um, And with me today is Samantha Sutherland, uh, and she is a director on the team, also focused on the uh, compliance matters uh, that the industry faces. Um, Today, we want to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, really the, the 2023 forecast of the compliance landscape for the industry. Uh, And we've really seen a lot of of activity in 2022 that we feel will have an impact on the compliance landscape in 2023 um, and are things that companies really need to be aware of and make sure that they are uh, addressing in the new year. Uh, Some of it is new, um, but to a certain extent, we are seeing a little bit of a return to the old um, with just some subtle differences related to that. Um, And we want to kind of walk you through what those differences are and what are some of the areas that, that, again, you need to be aware of. Um, But the one constant year over year is that the compliance landscape does continue to evolve, uh, and it's imperative uh, upon organizations to remain agile uh, and to have multifaceted compliance programs that will allow them to quickly pivot to address emerging risks and areas of focus uh, by the regulatory authorities. So what are we seeing in 2023 for compliance? 
So we're really seeing uh, four main areas that we think companies uh, need to be aware of in, uh, in the new year. Um, we see these as uh, patient engagement and advocacy, uh, which is an area that we have brought up uh, in the past, but there have been some, um, I think, significant activities uh, and, and areas of focus related to patient engagement uh, and advocacy that we'd like to um, go over with you and, and so that you're aware of it, um, uh, of the risks associated with it. The other is data analytics, which is another area that we've talked about in the past, but which, again, there has been additional activity uh, in terms of guidelines uh, from the regulators that um, really reiterates the need for leveraging data in your compliance program. Um, we'd also like to give you an update on price and spend transparency, which is the third area, um, and, and some of the things that have occurred over the past year that we need to be aware of in the new. Uh, and then lastly, going through um, really what that what are the old things that are, are rearing its head again? So what's the old is new uh, areas of concern that companies need to be aware of in 2023? Uh, so with that, um, what we'd like to do is break down each one of these four things for you. Um, and uh, Sam's gonna start by walking you through uh, some considerations related to patient engagement and advocacy in the new year. Thank you, Mark. Um, so as Mark mentioned, we've been speaking about patient engagement and advocacy as a high risk area for years, and that's not changing anytime soon. Uh, we continue to hear a lot of noise that the OIG and DOJ are hyper focused on any interactions, especially those with subsequent transfers of value with patients. Um, keep in mind here when we say hyper-focused, the DOJ does have a dedicated compliance expert team that train other individuals like trial attorneys on compliance specific to the life sciences industry, and they've doubled their size since 2009. So saying that there's an increased hyper-focus is, is a real uh, tangible thing. Um, they're also you know, doubling down on um, something they haven't provided a lot of guidance to our, our pharmaceutical medical device and biotech tech companies um, on. And in lieu of, of guidance being provided, um, keep in mind that Mary Reardon from the OIG re recently referenced using CIAs to define goalposts for certain activities. So keep in mind, having no formal guidance from the government does not mean that you cannot pull together uh, nice compliance guardrails from CIAs, DPAs, uh, enforcement activity, advisory op opinions, et cetera. In 2023, because of this, we do anticipate that companies will be more risk adverse in how they are interacting and compensating patients for certain activities. Um, this would, you know, examples of, of the ways that we see clients um, engaging patients, and some of these are our new, fairly new ways, is uh, patient ambassador programs. Uh, paying for patient data initiatives, so essentially running a company-sponsored uh, registry, patient registry. Using patients for social media influencer activities is also uh, a fairly new concept that we see companies, um, you know, grappling with how to handle. Um, in terms of patient influencers specifically, we do want to highlight a couple key items here. This first being fair market value. So with any consulting arrangement um, where you are engaging patients to perform certain services, you should have an established documented formal fair market value rate card. Um, FMV for uh, social media, whether you're talking about patients here or HCPs, which we'll touch on in a later slide, um, the FMV methodology and approach is, is a little different than your standard consulting and speaker program arrangement. So keep that in mind. Um, there's also challenges in complying with pharmacovigilant and um, promotional communication regulation. So if you are uh, engaging with a patient as a social media influencer and they're making posts to their platform and the comment functionality is turned on, it is the manufacturer's responsibility to monitor the comments for adverse events or product quality complaints. So um, a lot of times it, it might be best practice to turn off that comment functionality so that you do not have to continuously monitor um, social media posts. Additionally, there's limited regulatory guidance. So again, you know, not a lot um, of, of concrete black and white guidance on how to engage patients and especially within the social media uh, realm. Additionally, we wanted to highlight interactions with patient advocacy organizations. So as the, the um, industry continues to invest in rare disease 
um, therapeutic states, you the the engagement with patient advocacy organizations is going going to continue, if not increase. And with that, um, there continues to be uh, you know a a um, key strategy, and and especially for your diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. So obviously, you want to confirm that the patient population that you have within your clinical trials is appropriate, um, and consider DEI in that. And then the same risks apply here for engaging with patient advocacy organizations is just that there's not a lot of really great guidance from the government. So you really have to err on uh, with caution um, and, and consider these high risk interactions when you are engaging with them. The next area we want to go through with you is around the data-driven compliance programs. So in last year's 2022 industry outlook, we included the need for data-driven compliance programs and, uh, and utilizing data analytics to address the DOJ's revised guidance for an effective compliance program, which they had published in 2020 uh, and which came out and pretty much said it's an expectation of theirs that you now use data analytics in incorporating data into your compliance program. Um, and apparently people listen because we're starting to see a lot of companies now are starting to address that and they're starting to incorporate some kind of data analytic function within their compliance program or to at least inform their compliance program um, and identify areas that may need additional auditing and monitoring. We wanted to include it here again uh, because in September of this year, Deputy Attorney General Monaco released a memo uh, sort of re-emphasizing uh, the importance of an analytically informed compliance program. Um, so if you have not started or gone down that road yet of implementing um, data analytics uh, and incorporating that into your compliance program, um, you know, I think the, the, the message from, uh, from the Deputy Attorney General uh, is making it even more clear that if they were, to, if the Department of Justice were to come in and take a look at your compliance program, um, that they are uh, expecting to see that you are um, doing things across these four um, uh, categories here, uh, as as and have adopted that as part of the elements of your compliance program. So being proactive. Um, you know, in terms of identifying your risk and then addressing those risks once you have identified that, uh, identified them. I actually spoke on this topic at the annual MedTech conference back in October. And one of the concerns that the audience had related to this whole notion of, 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 of leveraging data for compliance um, was that uh, it's the whole idea of you can't unring the bell. Um, and that if the data, because the power of data analytics is so great now that you can see some, some you can see a lot. Um, the concern is that it could reveal some kind of a finding that if they were not to take any, um, if they were not, if they were to not address it or take any remediation on it, that that could actually be much worse um, um, to the organization. Um, and really, uh, the the revised guidance from the Department of Justice, as well as this memo from the Deputy Attorney General, is really saying that a head in the sand um, compliance program, uh, or a head or, or a head in the sand policy with regards to compliance, um, uh, will be noticed and 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 will not be good for the organization if that is what is found. Um, and so companies really need to um, move forward with utilizing data analytics. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in 2023 uh, to be more proactive, to promote continuous improvement like the Department of Justice has, has been talking about. Um, and the technology that is out there around data analytics is such now that um, not only can it reveal a lot, but there's also technology related to the documentation of any remediation steps that you either have made to address what is found by the data um, or that you are planning on addressing uh, over a defined timeline, um, which really sort of addresses that concern of, of not being able to unring the bell if the data were to reveal something, um, uh, some material non-compliant act. So again, wanted to include that here just to reiterate that in 2023, we're expecting to see more and more companies addressing this and adopting um, some form of data analytics or a data informed compliance program. Uh, the third area we'd like to uh, address for uh, consideration in 2023 
um, is really uh, to, to provide you really with an update on, um, on the transparency space. So both price transparency and spend transparency. Um, so the first one on the top left here is um, notably, um, there have been uh, no new state price transparency laws in 2022, um, which is somewhat odd because as, as a lot of you may know, there are currently 21 states that have some sort of a price transparency law in place, either for disclosing the price of a product that you are bringing to market in that state for the first time, um, or if you were to take a price increase uh, over a certain threshold over a defined period of time uh, for an existing product. Um, in addition to those 21 states, there are like another 20 states that have some sort of pending legislation um, around their own price transparency law. Um, and there was a huge increase in the number of states that had this in, from 2020 and 2021, only to see it come to an abrupt halt in 2022. Not only are there no more states that are kind of in, including their own version of a price transparency law, but we're also not seeing any additional states pass those laws in 2022. So where have we seen this happen before? Um, and the answer to that question is we've seen it before with regards to spend transparency, where there were a large number of states that had some sort of their own version of spend transparency uh, requirements um, pending um, in, their, in their state government that was never enacted because it became very, very clear that there was going to be a federal requirement. So if you were to read the tea leaves there, right, and draw a, conc uh, a conclusion based on what we saw with spend transparency, I think it's logical and reasonable to assume that in the very near future, because of this deliberate halt that we're seeing at the state level, that there's going to be some sort of a federal requirement with regards to price transparency, if not in 2023, then probably by 2024. And if there, and we'll see also with the, with the election if that has any effect on it as well. Um, we also think that that's going to expand, uh, not just to federal, but that right now price transparency laws only apply to pharmaceutical companies. We also think it's going to expand to cover medical device and other, uh, sectors of the life sciences industry. Going directly below down to, um, uh, the Italian Sunshine Act. So as some of you may be aware in 2020, in June of 2022, the, the long awaited Italian Sunshine Act was passed. Um, around spend transparency. Um, the, uh, the Italian uh, Sunshine Act with regards to um, uh, enforcement level and or level of rigor in terms of complying with it is somewhat similar to the French Sunshine Act. So um, as most of you who are involved in spend transparency know, the French Sunshine Act um, has some of the toughest requirements to comply with um, we're expecting, uh, or, or it appears that the Italian Sunshine Act is going to be similar. Um, and one differentiating factor of the Italian Sunshine Act that is different from maybe any other country um, is that there is a separate disclosure process uh, for licensing fees and royalties, um, as well as shared ownership by HCPs that needs to be disclosed probably on an annual basis is what we're expecting, whereas transfer of value and agreement disclosure is going to need to be done on a semester basis or twice a year. Um, and we um, and it's expected that that collection of that spend or transfers of value would need to occur in Italy um, uh, in January of 2023. Um, and again, with disclosure um, uh, twice a year. So something to be aware of in 2023 and that companies are going to need to be addressing. Um, Going directly over to the right around uh, 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 California, um, one of the new developments in 2022 was that California implemented the requirement that HCPs disclose the availability or existence of the federal open payments data. This is a reaction to sort of the frustration that the government has had in that the whole point of spend transparency or the Sunshine Act, right, was to shine a light between the financial arrangements or transfers of value between the life sciences industry and healthcare professionals, only to find out after much money, time and resources were spent by companies to put these things in place and have this information being reported fully and accurately, only to find out that no one is really using it, right? And that patients are unaware and, and, and for a, a good amount, HCPs themselves uh, may even be unaware of this information being publicly available. And so the implementation by the state of California 
is really the first step in addressing, I think, that frustration to ensure that patients are aware that this data is available and that patients can look up to see what are the financial arrangements or financial transactions that have occurred um, between their healthcare professional uh, and the industry and which companies in particular. Which leads me to the top right, which is there needs to be ongoing focus on this on, on, and continuing focus on the federal spend transparency requirements, mainly because of what is happening in California, because that's probably going to expand to be a federal requirement around, disclose, or around the requirement to disclose availability of the data, which means there's going to be a lot more public focus on the data once awareness is fully rolled out. And so because there's going to be more awareness, there's going to be more people looking at the data, which means you need to be more and more aware of the data that is being shared out there publicly and ensure that, again, the financial arrangements you have with HCPs are compliant and that the information that is being disclosed is full, is um, comprehensive and accurate. So something, again, to really be aware of in 2023, um, all four of these areas to be aware of with regards to transparency. Um, so I'll turn it over now, back over to Sam, who's going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the old is new. Thanks, Mark. Um, so rounding out our discussion on, on the regulatory landscape before we speak specifically about HCP engagements, we wanted to highlight sort of, you know, historically uh, high risk, high focus areas that are going to continue through 2023. Um, so recent settlements and statements from the OIG um, indicate, you know, that that there's still a high focus on, of course, payments to HCPs, uh, kick you know, uh, um, potentially violating the anti-kickback statute, the False Claims Act, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, and our, all of our global anti-corruption, anti-bribery um, laws across the world. Specifically, we wanted to highlight medical education grants, HCP FMV, and meal limits. In terms of medical education grants, uh, Mary Reardon from the OIG mentioned medical education grants um, at a recent conference as still being an issue and a focus area where the OIG is seeing continued violations. Um, there was also an advisory opinion um, this year in June of, of 2022 related to compensation and payment arrangements for your continuing medical education uh, program. So still very much a, a high focus area and something that um, companies should continue to focus on. HCP FMV is another area where um, there is still going to be a, a high amount of risk. And, and that is, is true of traditional um, consulting and speaker program arrangements, but is also true because of the new ways in which we see industry engaging HCP. So that would go across your social media influencers, your patient advocacy executives. Um, so specifically with the social media influencers, I touched on this earlier with patient um, social media influence, influence but the same um, uh, elements that, that need to be in place for patients also need to be in place for HCP. So you need to make sure before you're executing any contracts or arrangements for social media influencer activities that you have a um, robust, uh, documented, and um, uh, uh, a formal FMV analysis to determine what amount you should be paying for social media activities. It is a slightly different calculation than your standard FMV for a speaker program and advisory board because there is an element of their intangible um, social media network and the platform um, and profile that they've built on the platform that they're engaging and posting on. We also see FMV for patient advocacy executives um, causing some uh, some issues for our clients. So, you know, making sure that you have the appropriate background of those individuals, qualifications, credentials to identify the appropriate raw compensation data to assign as the basis for the fair market value calculation is extremely important. Additionally, we do see um, inflation being an issue, you know, historically in certain Latin American countries like Argentina and Colombia, but now even in the United States, we're having a fair amount of inflation. So um, how, do you, how do you handle inflation in your HCP FMV calculations is another uh, challenge that is causing um, some risk in our clients' FMV programs. And then the last element here of meal limits. So um, meal limits continue to be a um, you know an item that the DOJ and OIG focus on. This was one of the elements that was included in the um, 
groundbreaking $900 million settlement for Biogen was related to meal limits. Uh, we do see in 2023, potentially our clients increasing these by a very nominal amount. Um, but something to keep in mind as we continue to get questions about inflation related to meal limits. And just know that um, inflation on goods and services is not a one for one increase on um, the amount of, of uh, meal cost or alcohol cost at restaurants. So um, there is not a, uh, a warranted or defensible large significant increase in your meal limits for in office, out of office, breakfast, lunch, dinner. However, uh, it may be defensible to have a nominal increase in your meal limits in 2023. So lots of great things uh, to think about as we move into the new year. Before we turn it over to our next presenters, please check out the Baker Tilly website for our newly launched technology tool, KOL Now. We're really excited to have launched this tool last month, and we've partnered with a data insights provider to pre-tier 8 million global KOLs. Check it out. Now I'm going to turn it over to Darren and Grace, who will be discussing health equity and patient access. I'm Darren Jones. I'm a principal. Uh, here at Baker Tilly, leading our life sciences advisory team. You know, happy you are all able to, to join us. I'm also really ecstatic to be joined by by my my recent addition to the team, recent colleague Grace Macalino. Grace, hey everyone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grace Macalino. Super excited to engage in this conversation about health equity and patient access. We'd be remiss talking about the life sciences industry to not address this. So super excited to get into it, Darren. Next slide. So uh, COVID definitely shined a light on the existing health disparities and uh, health equity issues that are out there. As we move into a post-COVID world, uh, those issues continue. And we're really um, excited about the fact that things are really starting to be paid attention to as it relates to health equity. Uh, lots and lots of issues that impact the why health equity issues exist and opportunities, in fact, where and how we can address these issues. Darren, you and I have had many conversations about this in the past, and it's definitely, um, you know, a favorite topic of ours for sure to bring uh, awareness as well as attention where and how we can provide support and solutions to, you know, how folks can really make a difference in the area of um, health equity and patient access. Yeah, I mean, Grace, the, the disparities in access to fair, affordable, effective health care, right? I mean, I think it's something that we 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 struggle with on a domestic level and a domestic and it's a focus for for many health policy experts in, in DC on how to address that domestically, but but it's a global issue. And, and as you said, you know, I think the pandemic only really shine a very bright light on the global disparities in access to to fair uh, to fair, fair access to healthcare. Uh, and how do you create health equity? How do we make sure um, you know, as many of our clients tell us, and even as an advisor to the industry, we help our clients establish sort of a patient centricity view of their commercial and medical strategy. Um, but, but what does patient centricity mean? And how does patient centricity, I think, help to create, call it the, the, the framework or, or the guardrails, you know, by which industry can help to resolve some of these access and equity related challenges? I mean, I think it's important to bring up the challenges that already exist and why they're in place in the first place, right? There are definitely issues such as trust, right? There's uh, a lot of mistrust of the healthcare community. Do they really have our in, you know, best intentions at heart? Are they trying to give access to all? Uh, you know, are there underserved populations that have existed and remain there because you know, uh, structures are in place to keep it that way? Um, you know, limited access can be anything from you know, uh, health literacy, are folks able to really understand the information that's out there as our healthcare becomes that much more sophisticated, understanding um, all that they need to as far as patient education and where and how can they access, you know, who are the thought leaders in a community, really, um, do they believe, you know, that this is a good treatment or therapy or these, you know, issues are real and really impact their populations, right? Those are, you know, some of the challenges that exist in specific communities that are, you um, they're not just there, but have been there for a really long time and where and how can uh, the industry really speak to that and really help change that trust, um, start providing access and really education in a way that it's needed most, don't you think? Absolutely. And I mean, Grace, part of your part of your your career, I mean, one of the, the stories you've often you've often shared that I find fascinating is some of your personal experience in in helping organizations find 
those unmet populations and, and recognizing that sometimes it does take a, a different strategy um, and it takes a more innovative strategy sometimes to be able to find those populations. But but this is this issue, obviously, it, it pertains to, um, you know, commercialized product that pertains to clinical trial and enrollment and, and making sure that we uh, are enrolling patients that are, are reflective of the of the demographics of, of our country or, or the world. Um, and maybe you can share maybe a couple of examples of what you've seen in your clinical ex- expertise. For sure. No, happy to do so. So it really is very interesting, but maybe not surprising, right? The different communities, not just access healthcare differently, but have different thought leaders. You know, we talk a lot in the industry about key opinion leaders, but maybe for a particular community who a key opinion leader might be very different than, you know, a renowned scientist or a researcher or a doctor that um, is very removed from their lived experience, right? So in my past research and work, I've worked uh, to develop health promotion and getting into communities where, you know, reaching out to thought leaders in their communities, our beauty salon um, uh, owners or um, stylists, barbershop owners and, uh, you know, barbers themselves, really um, trusted folks in their communities where, you know, a lot of train that trainer, you know, work is just super, super valuable in getting a community to really shift their focus and attention on prevention and thinking about treatments that are you know, not so far removed from their conversations, like that people are engaging in discussions about their health and where and how, okay, this is really for us, you know, this isn't removed from us, right? So that's just some examples in terms of where, and you and I've also talked a lot about where patient advocacy organizations do a really nice job um, in the very beginning to really, you know, bring in that voice, you know, where and how are you able to include um, patients in clinical trials is only as good as their willingness to be part of studies because it's on their radar screens, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have to be willing to, to, to engage, I mean, as an industry, I think we have to be willing to recognize that we have a challenge, right? And we, and we mm-hmm. have an issue um, and we have the resources and, and the means and the capability to help to resolve it. Um, it does take a, a different lens, a different kind of thinking, I think, to do it effectively. I would say the other element of this, and I really like your how you highlighted advocacy, you know, and, and advocacy, you know, is really broad, is really broad. And I think oftentimes we're working with clients on, you know, defining an advocacy strategy and how they're engaging with patient advocacy, you know, but the advocacy we're talking about here is, is much more broad. I mean, we're talking about advocating for healthcare, advocating for individual patients to really understand and really understand the need for them to sometimes advocate for their own care. Um, you know, and, and industry, I think, you know, I think to some respects, we have a little bit of an obligation here to help to facilitate and foster, you know, that dialogue and, and help to bring these parties together. Um, you know, we've, we've been focused on lowering the barriers to access for our therapies. You know, that is a, a core function of, of the market access and commercial platform you know, for, for many breakthrough therapies in both the pharma and the bio and the device sectors. Um, mm-hmm. But now that we've worked to make sure that patients with coverage can gain access, how do we then just focus on access more broadly? Um, and I think that that's a little bit of the, the challenge to the industry. And and I would say, you know, perhaps some of the, the obligations, call it the moral or social obligation, I think, as, as leaders in healthcare, that industry really needs to embrace. A hundred percent. And I think before we move on to the next slide, I just want to speak to yet another challenge you bring up medical devices, medical technology, just the technology as technology grows and, you know, becomes more and more part of how healthcare is uh, both provided and, you know, the role that it plays, that gap, bridging that gap between the people who have are, are technologically savvy and those that aren't, whether it's related to age or, you know, um, different Uh, groups that have less access to technology or understanding or appreciate how to use technology, you know, where and how we as an industry can speak to bridging that gap, I think will be super important as well. I I totally agree. You know, if we move to the next slide, I mean, I think what's what what I find striking is that as an industry, we we have the construct in place to really help to drive and and drive a solution, you know, to the the health equity challenges that that society is, is dealing with. Um, you know, I think if, if we if we proclaim to have a patient centric mission and, and vision, um, you know, really thinking about how we broadly live that mission and vision and how that impacts, you know, how we structure some of these pre-existing programs. 
You know, I think when individual when individual organizations think about how can they have a meaningful impact on health equity and health access, this is not something that needs to be built from from the ground up. This is something right. where much of the infrastructure already exists. We mm-hmm. already have it. We've already talked about patient advocacy. We have an infrastructure to really go out and engage patient advocacy organizations. Are we also looking to engage in health advocacy organizations that help to advance the health literacy, as you highlighted, Grace, in these underserved communities to enable patients to sometimes advocate more effectively, you know, for their own health care, you know, around engaging with physicians. You know, we're always, you know, we're always looking through, you know, physician data when we're coming up with our territory management for sales call planning, you know, but again, how are we making sure that we're stratifying some of those physicians to make sure that we're identifying the physicians that are treating some of these underserved um, you know, communities. You know, I think oftentimes, whether explicitly or implicitly, intentional or unintentional, there's often a focus on sometimes, unfortunately, the most profitable patients and those with commercial coverage, um, and a little bit of a of a less of a focus in the commercial and HCP engagement planning on some of the physicians in those other communities. But we know who they are, uh, and ignoring them, you know, is is sort of you know, we're, whether we mean to or not, we're willfully sometimes ignoring you know, those particular physicians and the opportunity to engage and educate those physicians and their and their patients. Um, you know, similarly, I'm sorry, go ahead, Grace. No, I was just going to say, and, and Darren, I think the dangerous oversight from that perspective is, you know, more and more of those populations really could provide so much uh, to impacting, uh, you know, United States health, global health in general, and just frankly, just a brand in general, right? I mean, I think with data-driven solutions as more and more, you know, um, it doesn't even have to be that much more expensive if you're literally let the data drive where and how can you be thoughtful and helpful in terms of answering some of these tough questions, right? How do you get access to communities to really be able to open up a market that might not have existed for you in the past, right? So I don't think it has to be either or, but I do think that an acknowledgement for, you know, we cannot ignore certain segments of the population for sure is, is just valuable. And I think um, as we start thinking about value-based care, where and how you're differentiating, I think it would be impossible to ignore, you know, where health disparities exist. I think that, you know, in every hospital, different situation, you know, healthcare providers settings, that there are disparities that are clear even to them in their local offices. So where and how they're able to address where they provide value and where their care is um, of better quality to a broad base of a populate uh, patient population, I think will in the end, you know, pay off for sure. Absolutely, absolutely, and it, that also brings us to kind of the, you know, if we think about the patient support programs. I mean, this this component of a access, you know, support mechanism has been in place for a long time in terms of providing financial support, um, you know, copay support to individuals who can't afford their their medicines. Yes. But oftentimes, you know, that. You know, that is viewed as the core component of the access um, support, right? And, and kind of what industry is doing to support health equity. But, but as we've highlighted here, I think the need goes beyond financial support. Um, and I just really want to go back to advocacy and literacy, right? I mean, I think, you know, Grace, as you highlighted some of the key trends, I mean, those are the two elements that, that really strike me. You know, you highlighted value-based care. You know, there's because there's such a, a greater emphasis um, today on really being able to demonstrate positive health outcomes as a means of securing payer coverage, mm-hmm. as a means of generating evidence to support commercial positions. You know, I think the need to be able to reach broader populations and be able to demonstrate the outcomes, it has it has commercial value, right? This is, this is not something I, I feel like we need to address as an industry just from a standpoint of our, of our social or moral obligation. But I think there's also you know, opportunity here to generate really Agreed. valuable scientific evidence from members of the community that typically have, have, have been underserved or underrepresented in the clinical data. Agreed, 100%. And it will ultimately impact their trials and their ability to show value to a broad-based population if they're not able to access those patient populations. So I agree. Yeah. I mean, and maybe my last comment here is, is there's, well, there, there's a, certainly a, a global kind of this is this yes. is of interest globally, um, and there actually has been you know a set of standards you know around around ESG around this sustainability and uh, you know initiative um, you know to to look at and and the sustainability accounting uh, sustainability accounting standards board has created 
a set of a set of guidelines um, and a set of guidelines that is relevant for our industry in terms of, of looking at how we can support health equity and access. And there's actually some very specific, you know, I can't call them requirements, but there are some very specific standards um, that are advocated for our industry and in those standards. And, and I think this is something, you know, that I would say it's a little it's a little light, but I think there is room for for interpretation and certainly a move in the right direction for us to understand these sustainability standards on how they pertain to health equity and really to start moving as an organization to adapting you know, many of the capabilities that we've highlighted in this conversation and on this particular slide to help to address, you know, some of those global disparities. No, much agreed. Even just this sort of newfound focus on ESG to begin with feels like, okay, now there's actually an effort that's starting to pay attention, you know, really include this patient access and health equity component in the work that's being done in industry. I agree. It's awesome. Absolutely. So, so we want to, you know, as we talk about kind of the, again, these global standards and the global business, um, you know, I do want to bring in some global perspectives on, on our industry and, and what we're seeing as some of those overriding global uh, perspectives on the industry. And with that, um, pivot to our, our colleagues, Mario Prohaski, and back to Samantha Brabant again. Thank you, Darren, uh, for this introduction. Uh, with that, we will now move into our next segment, our global industry perspective. Uh, my name is uh, Mario Prohaski. I'm a director with our life sciences advisory uh, practice here at Baker Tilly. Uh, for this uh, session, I am also joined by Samantha Brayman, uh, senior manager with our uh, life sciences advisory team uh, as well. In our session, we will cover uh, some of the key uh, global industry uh, trends uh, that we see um, affecting the life sciences industry in 2023. Uh, and from our perspective, this will be a combination of both um, a continuation of some of those uh, trends we've seen in the last few years, and then to some extent, an adaptation um, as, as the industry continues to grow and evolve um, you know, in, in 2023. Um, the first one, um, I think we'll see a continuous focus, focus on global patient engagement and issues around patient equity, uh, the, the need for a coordinated and effective patient engagement strategy. Uh, is going to be critical for uh, the life sciences industry, both within uh, regions and also within specific specific countries as well. I think as we also continue to adapt to new ways of working um, in a post-COVID environment, uh, we'll see an evolution in the customer engagement uh, process as we continue to drive more effective and, and hopefully better engagement uh, with HCPs and other healthcare professionals, but also generally with external stakeholders uh, across across the industry. ESG will also be a, a continuous focus um, for our industry and probably even more so than in prior years. Uh, we see this as something that will be continuously fully embedded in the business operations of, of, our, of our clients. Uh, I think particularly the social aspect of ESG uh, presents unique challenges to the life science industry, and we'll touch on that a little bit uh, in more detail uh, shortly as well. And then lastly, compliance programs and, and risk management programs will continue to, to need to be calibrated and adapt to both internal um, pressures and, and changes in the ways of working uh, of, of the industry, but also uh, the uh, continuous evolution of external, uh, particularly regulatory pressures. Um, one of the key um, challenges that I think we see uh, as important for uh, for 2023 uh, in, in our work in compliance is also the question, how does compliance continue to stay in the room uh, as an effective business partner, seeing uh, or given some of those um, challenges, both internally as well as the continuous external pressures uh, that we're noticing as well. Um, global industry growth uh, will continue uh, to be seen this year. Uh, as well as continuous uh, innovation in, in the development of new products. Um, and what, some of the numbers that we are seeing uh, in the last couple of years are quite impressive. Um, high numbers, high, high dollar values in terms of R&D investment, um, you know, global pharmaceutical market revenue being around 1.4 trillion in 2021. And I think those numbers are going to continue to increase are they going to increase at the same clip as before? I think that's something that uh, will remain to be seen uh, given some of the uh, economic headwinds that we're experiencing 
and the potential that uh, this will impact M&A activity in our industry as well. The positive impact, however, is, is undoubted. Uh, if you, we've just seen the success stories of the COVID vaccines and treatments in the last few years and other very significant efforts in uh, disease eradication and improvements in life expectancy and quality of life. Yet, the, the public perception um, continues to be negative and one where we're continuing to, to be challenged with a question of trust in our industry. So I think that dichotomy is also going to be continuously important um, as we continue to see more uh, regulatory and compliance pressures from a global perspective. And then lastly, if we look a little more broadly, um, we, I think we expect to see um, continuous importance in terms of the access to data and technology, uh, both in terms of the way customer engagement uh, operates uh, across the industry and also in the ways in which we deploy data um, in order to be more effective in our business operations. That is going to be coupled with um, you know, continuous changes in the medical profession. Uh, we're seeing um, continuous pressure for life sciences companies to, to be able to effectively engage with medical professionals who have less and less time for direct engagement. So the whole question of kind of um, omni-channel and, and sort of um, very channel engagement is going to be is going to be continuously important. And then lastly, the growing role of other providers such as nurses and pharmacists and the way we engage with them uh, is going to be also critical um, in, in, in this year. One thing to also note is that the attention to specialty products, both in terms of their high commercial potential, as well as um, the high hurdles that they face in terms of product effectiveness during the approval process uh, is going to be something that uh, will be noteworthy uh, in 2023, um, particularly also in the context of growing scrutiny on the overall approval process in developed markets such as the US uh, and the European Union. All of these things lead to inherent business and regulatory and compliance challenges uh, that the industry will need to adapt to um, in, uh, in 2023. Sam, is there anything else that, uh, that you wanted to add uh, at this point? Uh, no, I think you've done a great job covering kind of the larger global landscape. I think there's just a lot of uncertainty that, you know, continues to plague the industry. So I uh, appreciate your commentary. Um, so with that and kind of on the theme of um, changing customer engagement and the changing role of medical affairs, um, we really expect to see a focus on, you know, the evolution of customer engagement and continued um, changes in how the external environment is going to impact global strategy for life sciences companies. So when we talk about customer engagement and some of the changes that have really shaped life sciences, you know, we're talking about things like really that kind of permanent shift towards a hybrid model of engagement with customers. So what we thought was once kind of, you know, a COVID reality has now become the new normal where, you know, there's there's less and less uh, in-person access. So life sciences companies are really exploring other avenues for customer engagement. So things like social media and other types of virtual interactions have really become part of a normal commercial strategy. Um, with that, every touch point that, you know, life sciences companies have with all of the healthcare professionals become increasingly important and really having a definitive approach and kind of vision for those engagements becomes really, really important. So every minute becomes um, the most valuable, get the most value out of it that the life sciences companies can. Um, additionally, thinking about changing the way life sciences companies approach interactions with different healthcare providers, um, there's really an increased focus on those allied health professionals, like Mario had mentioned, things like pharmacists and nurses are becoming increasingly important in the continuum of care. So how do you and how do life sciences companies engage them effectively in some of these conversations? And then, you know, last, that kind of ongoing oversight and really scrutiny by the government in terms of how life sciences companies are interacting with their constituents is still kind of a hot topic and isn't something that they can forget. So with that and all those trends, there's really four key building blocks of an effective customer strategy um, that we kind of see 
happening in 2023. So the first being a focus on outcomes-led strategy, right? So really focusing on the benefits of the patient and that patient-centric messaging to really drive effective customer engagement. Also expanding the role and making MSLs in, even more important than they have been in the past and really kind of expanding their footprint and their scientific voice to make, again, those interactions more meaningful for those healthcare professionals. Um, the third is really clarity and that channel engagement strategy. So there are a million ways that life sciences companies can engage with their healthcare professionals and get their message out there, but too much can be too much. So really focusing on the why behind those engagement strategies, their purpose, so that they really are meaningful and intentional. And last and probably the most important is really a desire for life sciences companies to approach their constituents with one voice, right? So for a healthcare provider, whether they're talking to a, a sales rep or a reimbursement manager or a MSL, they view it as one company, right? So how does a life sciences company internally make sure that all of their um, field force kind of have a continuous message and continuous voice while maintaining those boundaries that are required in terms of compliance and ethics programs and regulations? So overall, we just see a lot of focus on customer engagement strategy to make it more meaningful and patient focused for those um, providers, but then really seeing the life sciences companies grapple with how to do that while staying in the bounds of the regulatory environment that continues to pressure and plague the life sciences companies. Uh, Mario, do you have anything to add before I hand it over to you to talk to uh, talk about ESG? I think one one point that I would add here is that these all of these kind of building blocks are are, are not going to be static, right? So I think on top of making sure that those are in place, uh, what we see as important is also the need for um, building processes that are adaptable and that are flexible uh, in order to account for changes in the business environment. In fact, also changes in the way our customers want to engage with us. Um, you know new channels or evolving channels of communication um, and, and changing preferences on the part of uh, on the part of our customers uh, through their uh, through the consent management process which of course may also have downstream effects in terms of compliance or, or even data privacy uh, issues that will need to be addressed so that kind of flexibility and adaptability needs to be also part of this uh, as companies continue to um, build those fundamentals of having effective customer engagement uh, in 2023. And speaking of fundamentals in terms of business operations and, and strategy, um, ESG, I think, is going to be also something that uh, really will play a critical role in terms of uh, how we see our business uh, evolve uh, this year. Um, less and less a buzzword, I think, for life sciences companies and really more and more an operational um, a necessity uh, is, um, I think, the trend that we are seeing and what I think we'll continue to see um, this year. Uh, there are a number of kind of uh, key points here to consider. Um, on the environmental side of ESG, I think we'll see a continuous drive for robust reporting, uh, in particular in Europe, but also in other uh, jurisdictions with more and more requirements coming into place with regards to ESG reporting. Um, but what we see is actually really critical for the life sciences industry is the social aspect of, of ESG. So issues around product access and affordability, product quality and safety, of course, patient safety and equity of access, all of these things are going to be um, you know, increasingly important uh, from a business strategy and also operations standpoint. Um, and tied back to some of the trends that we also mentioned at the beginning with regards to um, issues around patient access and, and patient outcomes as well. Um, so I think ESG is going to be something that it will really be critical in terms of strategy and in terms of operations for the life sciences industry, and not just in certain regions uh, like in Europe, where this has been um, you know, kind of very much a, a leading um, strategic imperative for a while, but also in other regions uh, as well, where um, you know this is now becoming the business reality and, and a business necessity. Sam, is there anything else uh, you want to add on, on ESG, uh, perhaps before we continue on to compliance? Yeah, I think the one thing I would add, and I welcome your commentary as well, Mario, is 
on that social aspect with that focus on, you know, access to medicines, I would anticipate that that creates, again, a lot of compliance risk because there are a lot of concerns around how companies engage with patient advocacy organizations, what, you know, the donations that they're making. I mean, we haven't seen those settlements slow down. So I'm curious, like, if you have any kind of words of wisdom in terms of how life sciences companies can really balance that kind of focus on ESG while also kind of considering, you know, what that means in terms of some of the constraints with how they can interact with patient advocacy organizations and patients themselves. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great point, and it, and it absolutely is a balance that needs to be needs to be found. I think it also will need to be a dynamic balance to some extent, depending on the risk constraints uh, in various countries and, and regions. Uh, but this also points back to the fact that ESG um, as a as a fun, as a as a fundamental is also something that's going to be really important in terms of being embedded in your overall risk management approach. Um, right. So this is also where Thinking about risk um, and compliance from an enterprise standpoint uh, is, is critical. And ESG considerations, as well as quote unquote more traditional compliance considerations, are, do need to feed into, uh, I think, a, 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 a dynamic and a robust overall enterprise risk management strategy. I like, thank you. I appreciate that. And I guess I have one other question. I'm curious where do you typically see the responsibility for ESG lying? I feel like with some of my clients, it's kind of a hot potato where. You know, it doesn't necessarily have a home. So I'm curious if you kind of have thoughts on where that trend is going to land, like who is ultimately going to be end, end up holding the responsibility overall for ESG at organizations. I think that's a that's a question that will still still remains unresolved uh, from my from my experience. And I do see it as something that uh, will lie in in the preview of a combination of the legal and compliance function, as well as public affairs, as well as kind of the overall, um, as well as the operational teams of, of, of our clients. And who takes the lead may, may, be, um, may vary depending on maturity, depending on, on the size of the organization. But I think it's a combination of, uh, of those functions, most likely, uh, that, will need to, uh, that will need to take the lead um, in a collaborative effort at first, I'm sure, uh, in order to to establish an, a, a successful ESG approach uh, for each or each for each organization, absolutely, that's definitely what I've seen as well. Is it's typically a a big collaboration, and I think a lot of times it's making sure that you do have kind of that cross functional strategy because at the end of the day, it's not just a compliance thing or a legal thing or a regulatory thing. It's something that everybody needs to own and participate mm-hmm. in, given kind of the broad impacts of it. Yeah, it, it, in some ways, it reminds me of data privacy as well, right? Which is um, a, kind of an overarching topic that impacts all of our um, clients' operations. And it's not something that is necessarily only owned by one function. Um, and, and I think that we'll see something similar with ESG in terms of evolution, where this truly needs to be embedded in the way each individual function operates. Um, and really truly needs to be a collaborative effort across functions and from an overall um, implementation standpoint. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So with that, um, I'll wrap up by talking a little bit about the compliance program. And it really does kind of tie into the ESG conversation in terms of everybody's responsible for the culture of compliance and ethics at these life sciences companies. Um, of course, you know, things continue both internally and externally to impact compliance programs, compliance resourcing. As you heard from Mark and Sam S, a lot of things that, you know, we thought were kind of put to rest are resurfacing. So we anticipate 2023 globally to, you know, look a lot like the issues that we were facing, you know, 10 years ago. So with that being said, I think the biggest challenge plaguing life sciences companies globally with terms of compliance is really, again, grappling with, you know, changing remote uh, or changing work models, right? So hybrid remote work, how do you continue to kind of tap into that culture of compliance, making sure you have a strong kind of speak up message, 
making sure that you're kind of tying together the disparate global regulations and your compliance program, and really making sure that compliance still has a seat at the table globally, given that the workforce and the way we all work has changed so significantly from two to three years ago. Um, when we think about internal changes for life sciences companies, you know, something that hasn't changed is really focusing on a robust global culture of compliance, right? It's not just a U.S. thing. It's not just a European thing, but across the board, how do you make sure you kind of have that unified compliance voice, compliance message, and make sure that you're driving that ethics is the most important part of the business. Um, and then really effectively partnering as a compliance organization. So we've talked about a lot of changes in terms of business model, the focus on ESG. So how does compliance really partner with all of those functions to become value add or continue to stay value add and helping the business navigate some of these changes again, globally with the disparate regulations. Um, and then the last thing internally is again, keeping up with some of the changes where there's really no precedent in terms of customer engagement strategies, right? So as companies are kind of exploring these new ways of um, interacting with their HCPs and patients and new go-to-market strategies, how do they make sure that they're kind of on the front end of compliance and ethics, showing that, you know, they're making a good faith effort at complying with the global laws and regulations, and so really stay nimble as a compliance organization to really continue to drive value. Um, when we talk about external factors, there's really you know, ongoing scrutiny in terms of focus on patient access, disease awareness, education, social media. There's been recent guidance um, from FPA and IFPMA in terms of social media. So lots of focus on that because it's kind of the new frontier in terms of patient and healthcare provider interactions. Um, like I mentioned, the old areas that, you know, kind of have always challenged life sciences companies aren't going away. So we think about engaging healthcare providers, you know, fair market value and, you know, all of the kind of traditional uh, risks that life sciences companies face, all of that is still on the table. So making sure that you know, you don't get complacent in terms of uh, complying with those different laws and regulations. Um, and then the last is really kind of the ongoing increase in the breadth and depth of interactions and the complexity of those kind of global organizations and networks. How do you ensure that cross-border engagement and kind of considering your compliance counterparts in different countries how do you kind of stay up to date with that and making sure you're not being too self-focused and you're really considering the global impact of some of the decisions that you're making or the meetings that you're planning. And so really making sure that compliance remains a global function and has a global vision. So overall, all of these trends that we've kind of talked about really feed into the compliance and ethics program. And what it comes down to is making sure that you're appropriately resourced and that you have that kind of global vision and voice as a compliance program. Mario, do you have anything to add on that front? Yeah, I think just picking back off of your last point, I think the other thing that I'd see as critical is, is being able to use and deploy data effectively in order to, to drive um, the increased maturity of the compliance program. Uh, as, as compliance programs continue to, to be global, as we continue to you know see proliferating ways of engaging customers and in by extension to some extent a proliferation in risk types <laughs> uh, from a compliance perspective we need to be continuously smarter and smarter about how we deploy data in order to drive effective compliance decision making and i think that's that's something that will we'll just have to be part of our daily life as compliance professionals um in 2023 and, and beyond Absolutely. Um, with that, that concludes the global portion of the webinar, and we'll hand it back over to Darren for some closing thoughts. So thank you all for your time. I uh, appreciate everybody taking the time to join us. Uh, I think in summary, as we, as we look to the upcoming year, uh, looking for opportunities for our industry to continue to lead uh, and demonstrate life sciences as a growth sector. I think as Mike was highlighting, I think we'll see you know, steady valuations for those companies that are well-established 
Uh, but I think for, for others, where the true innovation is coming with, with some of the innovative companies, uh, I think it's going to be a challenge. It's definitely going to be a challenge to prove uh, the long-term value and to drive some of the valuations. And, and as a result, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the M&A market in the year ahead. Putting the strategy in a broader context, I think this element of, of corporate strategy and risk management, I think we're going to see a convergence of, of strategy and risk management into the ESG framework. Uh, I think this, this component of ESG is going to continue to play out uh, in our industry as a, as a key framework for how decisions are made in the future. And more importantly, how we start to change the public perception of our very fascinating and successful industry. I think as we think about how that's going to play out in the eyes of the patient, this continued focus on supporting patient access with greater emphasis on, on underserved populations, you know, how that how is that going to be accomplished? You know, how is outcomes data uh, and maybe even some of the data around the social determinants of health going to play a role in how we demonstrate fair and equitable and complete access to breakthrough therapies? You know, as Mark highlighted from a compliance point of view, you know, we're going to continue to see a streamlining of, of the HCP engagement practices. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how industry refines their, their target list, refines the number of HCPs and KOLs they're engaging with, and how data is going to play a key component in refining who we are engaging with and why. I think on that same vein, as we think about traditional multi-channel marketing, uh, and how that multi-channel marketing is really starting to focus much more heavily on social media. Um, and what does that mean in terms of how we engage with patient advocacy and patient advocates uh, to represent our brands on our behalf? Um, look, thinking about how the IFPMA has issued the recent guidance on social media uh, and, and the fact that I think we're still gonna find ourselves pushing the boundaries of what that guidance says. Uh, and will that lead to more scrutiny or more questions being raised uh, about how the industry is marketing on social media. So with that, I do want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, we are going to keep the platform open for another five minutes. So if you have a question, you know, please go ahead and submit your questions now or in the next couple of minutes. Uh, and don't forget to include your name so we can respond to you. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have enough time for open Q&A, but if you, again, submit your question, include your name, you know, we will certainly, you know, get back to you with, with our perspectives. Uh, and with that, uh, please stay tuned for upcoming content from Baker Tilly. You'll be receiving a follow-up email for this session, which will include all the details for our upcoming webinars and other thought leadership. So again, thank you very much for your attention. Happy New Year and best of luck.